Good evening, everyone. Hope you have a, a good start to the new year. Um, thank you, Sam, for being our first presenter of the year after our project uh, presentations. I hope you got you could digest this to give for those of you who are new here to get a sense of what's happening here at the center. That weekly get together, the global talks, is an opportunity to share, you know, sometimes emerging research or establish, and it's a, uh, you know, some of a very friendly crowd to give you, you know, advice and feedback on your research. So, but before we start off, let me put a line that we acknowledge and respect to the common peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands in the song is climate of common peoples whose historical relationship with this land continues. To this day, so as you will see throughout this term, um, issues of the legacy of colonialism, uh, the role of territory and place of um, the treatment of indigenous peoples in Canada will be very much part of our discussions. Um, and with this, let me introduce our speaker for today. You can see it up here, um, Samuel. Samuel um, Alis Azubokan, it's close enough, um, is a PhD candidate in the English department. And Lincoln, we are happy to have you here as a supervisor today. Um, and um, Sam works in the English department in a particular field looking at post-colonial literature um, and theory, global black studies. And, and that is, I think, this particular way in which Sam approaches this topic, uh, media studies as well. And in this, um, with his interest, he is a member of the Francis Studio for Comparative Media Studies, as well as the Spoken Web Canada Research Network. So, in a way, also, although very theoretically minded, you also think about applied in terms of media periods. And I'm very curious to hear about your research um, today uh, that uh, will probably be based on your PhD doctoral research. And uh, Sam, the floor is all yours, and you're welcome to share your screen at this stage. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, I'd like to say that it's a pleasure to be here, and um, thank you to the CNGS for the scholarship. And I'd like to say, one, that this is the developing text, so uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your feedback, comments, and questions. Yeah, so let me push it so um the title of my presentation is Atlantic Nathalie. And um I the term wording is was popularized by Martin Heidegger. So um in this presentation, we just going to summarize what I aim to do in my research, and of course in this presentation, and then try to um explain my understanding of the word of the concept wording, how it relates to. Um, black cultural studies, and then sketch out some thematic things that I've, so I've been trying to build up in my project, my research, and then complete the presentation. So thank you for your time. Um, so Martin Heidegger in in his book Being and Time, published in 1927, introduced the concept of world, <clears throat> and um, Heidegger. Which is quite complex, it can be very difficult to read sometimes <laughs> or multiple times. And so, uh, usually, there's for many scholars, there's no need for definition of the term. Um, but since the time he used it, it has been popularized and used in various ways. And um, I think that, though, however, just makes clear that world is a process, a continuous process of generative uh, meaning making and world making. So I'll talk more about that later on in the presentation. Um, so for Eidegger, um, the basis of our world is being that is our world is ceased or a world exists because um, of the presence of entities and the encounter between these entities um, without people or without beings living in the space and within the time, there would be a world. And as we experience the world and that encounter, our world in take place as we encounter people as we encounter places as we encounter things in the world, world in take place. And um from Shia, one of the very um critical in that I in terms of in the context of literary studies, 
have Adidas. Adidas world in all of us, the perspective of the world, where the world is what lets us be together with other beings and frees them for us to encounter. However, these encounters and processes of meaning making or world making should be ethical um, beyond Jesus. And this understanding of the world can only operate in what it calls in condition of non knowledge. We are experiencing in a system is that which one has to do with taking care of things in association or um, I think that calls process. Um, Warden has been used by scholars to improve economic and global issues over time. Um, for example, Gareth Spivak employs the concept in analyzing colonial processes and the colonial inscription of textuality. Um, for example, in an ITG5 um, article, three women texts, um, are the top lot to appropriate it in the explanation of the development and evolution of human civilization in this book. Um, the third way, which was published in 1980. Um, Paul Dupre thinks to word in, in the context of globalization and solidarity. Also, in Christian theology or theological arguments, uh, the term or the concept has been used uh, by Lawrence Paul Henning in his famous article, I the God's God, to explain the expression of God in the world. And also last by Rob Wilson and Christopher Connell to make situated practices of cultural studies. So um, the term has been all used and operated by several scholars, you know, in uh, across several, several disciplines. And um, that makes for me, I think that makes me stimulating conversation across, especially for somebody like me who's um researching in cultural studies. Um, so to return to what I how, how I understand Heidegger's idea, arguably there is no essentialist or universally attainable uh, understanding of world as a concept. So my project is not an in-depth philosophical engagement with Heidegger's phenomenology. However, it was interesting from that concept, you know, in negotiating and imagining freedom for black lives and by extension the world to respect culture. And uh, given current global realities where capitalist globalization has cast out the feasibility of grand pedagogies for human freedom, um, I think that um, the concept or the phenomenological idea of world law, I think as idea of encounter, ethical encounters, can be demonstrated to literature's um, normative force. And um, so I borrowed the term awarding um, in this space to look at what's applied to black cultural interactions with geographical space. So um, rather than seeing national identities um, in, or national identities in such terms as the product of natural parts such as language, um, soil, or region, um, the contemporary cultural theorist, Arjuna Padurai, has noted how modern nationalisms are constructed to acts of collective imagination. Uh, they are created and sustained through narratives of belonging and affiliation that bind um, geographically distant peoples together. So in the same vein, I use transatlantic black water to describe um, a cultural, social, and, and aesthetic effort to imaginatively and ethically remake the world by drawing from black resources, epistemologies, experiences and practices across the price of the Atlantic. Um, for those in the Caribbean, those in Africa, those in uh, North America, or in, um, it forms um, a collective, um, it forms um, a collective transnational, um, it forms a collective and transnational imagination of Black experiences in the homeland and its diaspora in relation to global issues. So through the lens of two black literary practices, Afrofuturism and African Futurism, I look into how um, this emerges in literature. So uh, Afrofuturism, which is the first um, literary practice or subgenre of speculative or black speculative, I think I'll be in art, um, or for a first coin back by Mark Berry, uh, which the term um, was used when African Americans began to write um, about their culture or their experiences um, 
in mm -hmm. terms of uh, uh, along with um, what I would call historical and uh, medical um, um, affiliations in terms of their experiences in Africa or supposed um, the cultural practices that they've um, they carried with them when um, they were educated to um, the Americas and all that. So, um, for my deal, there um, a futurism era as Black with a visioning of the past, present, and future. Um, in other words, Black artists, and creators, critics, and theorists who aim to focus their future against the carriers over determination in the present. Uh, given the overwhelming association of Blackness with crisis, um, the imperative to recast Black fortune becomes irresistible. Um, the challenges and predicament Black people experience are undeniable. However, for futurism, we see the essentialist construction of a repeatedly doomed Black destiny. And the Tasha Woma, who is a foremost Afrofuturist scholar, comments that Afrofuturism compares the awful capitalism that is often associated with the of the blackness. African futurism, on the other hand, is was coined by um, the popular futurist writer, or uh, uh, especially African speculative writer, um, Inundi Okuwafo. And for our African futurism is an ideological and aesthetic counterpart to Afrofuturism. But it's different in terms of its, of its aesthetic and political depth to Africa. Unlike Afrofuturist attention to the US and African American experiences. So, uh, in African Futurist novels, uh, excuse me, in African Futurist novels, African speculative picture writers present Africa or Africans as historical agents who produce their own future. At the same time, um, it is the philosophy of science that represents who the future, the future of African epistemologies mainstream scientific knowledge. However, although Afrofuturism and African Futurism are recognized as two different subgenres in literary discourse, Black characters often lie in between and across the grades of both categories. Their residency and nationality are not so much important as historical and cultural context. So using wording as an organizing analytic, I'd like to add that these literary practices do not only attend to Black lives, and the circumstances of also non human lives that coexist with them. And um, so I move on to um, one of the key arguments I'm trying to make in my project. Um, first, nature is seen as agential being, like nature as agency, and um, it's a being that as um, Edgar. Or Jesus, that we take your things in association, that nature is also part of the world and um, as its agency and its instrumental in the development of the world. So I'm reading to um, making this argument with two novels, um, one by October Bottler titled Parable of the Sower, and the second one, Lagoon, uh, written by Emily Okuwako. Um, in Parable of the Sower, um, it was Parable of the Sower was published in 1993, but the story begins in the year 2024 in Rubledo, South Africa, California. It was long for Lamina, a black 15-year-old girl at the Um, The novel is divided into two halves. The first half set in Rubledo shows how the social order in California in 2024 has broken down and things are in serious um, in this repair. So society is split into several groups in the story. The rich need the world estates, which lavish security systems. Um, the middle class is much threatened and the poor rich live in world communities and try to maintain the semblance of normal life. But jobs are scarce and no one has any prospects. Inflation has eroded the value of money and essentials such as water are expensive. Um, in Lawrence, neighborhood of the protagonist of the story, people try to grow as much of their own food as they can. For me to be rely on eating rabbits, and everyone in the community over the age of 15 is trained in how to use guns, since they cannot rely on the police force to prepare against the thieves who regularly break into their community. Outside, in unworld areas, the rule of law and the sense of community have totally collapsed. 
Um, on less dirty, just good hip hop people on the streets along with drugs and drug addicts. Uh, many are addicted to a drug that makes them commit arson because um, they love to watch things on. So the second part of the novel presents a gradually emerging contrast between the lawlessness and brutality of life in the first half. And amongst the traveling bands of refugees um, that Lauren, the protagonist, leads, there's a sense of community and mutual responsibility that eventually uh, characterizes the group. Lauren's quest is to recreate what an, what an IT community should be. At first, because of the dangerous situation she's in, she's ruthless, trusting no one and looking out only for herself and um, her two companions. But as she continues to travel north, she does not shut out the voice of compassion. Um, a key moment is when she puts Ali and Ji, um, Ali and Ji are two characters in the novel, she pulls them out of the rubble of the house. Bank who is also a member of the group and, and who eventually uh, falls in love with um, Lauren in the story, um, never loses his own sense of value. But surprisingly, ask her, I was surprised to see that anyone else cared what happened to a couple of strangers. Um, because before then, um, Lauren has been the leader who is so, who is not, who, who keeps, uh, who tried to keep to herself, even though she's the leader, and then kind of builds the wall around, around herself. So, um, back on the comment, but I was surprised to see that anyone else cared what happened to a couple of strangers, referring to um, Ali and Jill. Um, another key moment comes when um, Emily and her daughter are found in Goose Camp. Longing goes out of her way to feed them, offering them two of the five sweet pears that she had brought home to this area. In our example, other members of the group share what food they have. When Lauren puts out the idea that Emily and the girl could join their group, um, Annie tells her she's going to salt. He replies, you would have raised hell if you had tried to take in a beggar woman and a child a few weeks ago. But Lauren is not going to salt. She's simply demonstrating that in spite of the degradation and danger all around her, humans can still show that they care about each other. Then when a Jill is killed, our Lauren confronts grief speaking and you give up. The message she conveys is, in spite of your love and pain, you are not alone. It's still have people who care about you and want you to be all right. You still have family. When Lauren's new family, um, a heterogeneous multiracial group that spans several generations, arrives at a destination at the end of the group, they have learned to take care of each other. They are ready to develop a community based not on fear or exploitation, but on mutual respect and shared values. So one of the key issues what lies plus in the novel is environmental degradation about our platform representing the lives of these black characters and other racial uh, uh, characters who are other races in the story. And one of the key issues she raises is the issue of the environment. How environmental degradation um, contributes to the discussion of our world. She critiques certain human activities that destroy the climate and runs against a dystopian apocalypse that awaits unchecked capitalist extractive practices. Importantly, to praise nature as a living being, distinguishing between the human being as well as the non human being. So, for our both are crucial and our agency. Uh, but like his primacy and attention in the local and characterizes it as body of care as human beings. And as ever, Pandemia argues the parable of the sower scrutinizes the concatenation of ecological, of ecological and um, of ecological and social problems, positing humans as part and parcel of the environment on the one hand and showing nature or the non-human environment as an agential force, shaping human societies on the other hand. Indeed, Butler's story words fictionalize the intricately entangled interaction of black that between the human and the non-human environment, most blatantly manifest in power structures of exploitation that invariably instrumentalize, abuse, and degrade 
magnifies people and makes you alive. So um, yes, picture of the property of the book. Um, in the second novel, uh, Inedi Okoa first argument. Um, Inedi engages technological issues also. Um, in the novel, Black Heroes Rescue the City of Lagos, Nigeria, for its ecological, social, and political disasters. But telling about the story is its blend of technological possibilities. Um, Okuafo employs animist technology as an analytic in response to the colonial culture and ecological catastrophes experienced in the novel. The alien invasion of Lagos in the story reflects <coughs> historia, historical encounters with Africa, signaling an alternative experience with non local technology and entity that can be beneficial and non exploitative. So in the novel, uh, a couple of, like a couple of aliens invade the city and begin to um, attack, of course, social structural infrastructures that are being erected by capitalists, like by major corporations, multinational corporations, oil rigs, and the like. And also marine animals and marine creatures begin to also attack these, uh, for example, oil rigs that are um, taking oil offshore and all that. So Okorafo further points, or further the point that in the Anthropocene, <clears throat> human intentionality starts merging with non-human agencies that counteract them. Offshore and onshore crude oil extraction, waste dumping in the sea, and deforestation are some of the human activities that exceed hostile reactions of marine and terrestrial beings in the north. Okorafo shows that the potential of the non-human derives from its ability <clears throat> to enable new reflections upon the co- and interdependencies that encompass both human and non-human agency. This can only be achieved, achieved if the non-human is allowed a cultural space alongside the human, especially when considering that it is not only politics that determine the crisis we are currently living through in the world, but also the epistemologies that determine which possible worlds we can imagine and deem achievable. So Lagoon opens with an angry swordfish who is trying to rupture an undersea oil pipeline. As the story progresses, other marine creatures begin to roil and test, sometimes shift shifting into other bits. They turn over boats on the sea and attack oil bits. Through these non-human characters in the story, Okoa for suggests that non-human and its agencies are an important category for interpreting social and global issues. In other words, animals, plants, and other animate or inanimate non-human beings in our world should be considered alongside human agency in the tackling of issues that affect our world in the spirit of the Eiliger's call for us to take care of things in association with one another. Um, next, I want to add the next point is about identity and causes, for geographical and cultural causes, um, in the novels Midnight Rubber and the Old Priest. The Midnight Rubber, written by Carlo Hopkinson and published in 2000, the action takes place on two fictional planets. Tucson. The first planet is called Tucson, and its twin planet, Polonia. Called New Africa. The protagonist, Pantan, and the other inhabitants of the planet, Susan, are descendants of those people who had left it to forge a new society built on the racist premises of the terrestrial communities. In Tucson, there is an internet like information system known as Graninani, invented by the Marisho Corporation, which is the corporation is in command of Tucson. Um, this information system called Graninani injects each person on the planet at their beds with nanobytes, which allows um, mm -hmm. to have a men mental access to them. This access takes the form of an issue, like a kind of um, mythic creature. Um, the local, which also functions in the story as a local, as a local artificial intelligence, which exists as a voice within the head and performs multiple tasks and provides information upon request. 
that's an protagonist spends her childhood in a place called Cockpit County until her father, Alvin Antonio, poisons his wife's lover during a one of two sons, the planet Anand, Caliban, called John Carlo Caliban. Knowing that the all seem grand and punishing, he escapes with Tanta to the penal dimension uh, called the New Afro Three, where Granny Nadi cannot be changed. So the narrative of Midnight Robert chronicles the adventures and mythologizing actions of the protagonist, incorporating tales and myths from traditional African, Caribbean, <laughs> North American, and South American cultures. The opening line features the voice of a narrator much like in folk tradition. Inviting the reader into the story. And um, for example, the story opens with, uh, with this quote Oh, like it's starting me. Don't be frightened, sweetness. It's for the best. I go be I go be with you the long time. Trust me and let me distract you into making one analysis for you. So the story is written in Caribbean patois and a bit of French. So um <clears throat> Opposing kind of incorporates various kind of linguistic varieties, English, French, and of course, um, um, some native Caribbean um, expressions in the story, in the novel. So, Opposing draws, dwelling from various black cultural traditions to create a story, forms attention to the hybrid and not the nature of our world, a global world where international mobility is not only possible. But even cultural, political, and epistemological problems are possible. Um, as Elizabeth Boyle argued, that by imagining Afro Caribbean vernacular literary practices within the context of science fiction, Midnight Global is able to dissolve the tensions between textual and oral culture and between creator and creature, master and slave. Through the novel, Upkissing interrogates Black locations and relocation the possibilities and tensions of beautiful and cultural migrations. She also celebrates Black identity as well as comments on the interconnectedness of our world, despite obvious differences. And indeed, it remarks that the whole world is experiencing some kind of creolization or another, um, a sequence of kind of creolization or another, either to migration, to the borrowings, or economic interdependencies. Um, in the other novel, Nawal Sapel, um, on the other hand, argues that a historical and multi generational uh, look at our world is also a very, very important approach to discussing the world and how the world um, is being fashioned by counters. Um, in old days, she does this, um, she reverses the talk of migration from Africa to the rest of the world. In the story, she puts the world, she puts world events in perspective or puts Africa at the center. She tells the story of three generations of women who moved from different parts of the world to Lusaka, an African city in today's Zambia. One of them, Sibila, was born in Italy, but migrated to Zambia. Another character, Agnes, from a wealthy British family, lives and visits her children in Lusaka too. As Ajini Nawal suggests, what unites the women in the, in the story, uh, what unites them is more than their sameness, but also their, the sense that they are founders. For Sapel, they are the beginning of a nation that exists in its, in its ambitions and identity beyond the boundaries or expectations set by the, the British or the national structures. And the old also offset um, colonial British construction of the center and the focuses on Africa. However, Sapel does not romanticize Osaka or Africa. She paints its prettiness as well as its beauty. But by centering Africa in her story, she lays claim to a, a very unique quality of experience that is, that is present in Africa as well as in other places in the world. So um, I'm going to, yeah, so here is it, um, a picture of the book's cover page. Okay. Um, so then the last 
no rule out talking about is um, the city we became by um, NK Jameson, which uh, is also an official snow rule in where the story is set in New York. So in the story, um, we have queer characters, straight characters, people whose sexuality are also like in between, um, or whose sexuality, sexuality, sexuality uh, belongs to what uh, we be expect of. And in this, um, in the novel, Jameson tells us that sexuality, just as hybridity, or, or suggests that sexuality, just like hybridity, may be in a state of plus, may be in a process of becoming, or may be in a process, process of imagining. And um, for Jameson, the Black characters who are who sometimes are even had that and sometimes transform as avatars are uh, people in New York City who also allow the city to who match with the city in a way. Um, in other words, she tells us that the people are the city and the city is the people. She tells us that through these characters, their lives, their ways of living, and the various struggles that they experience. That just as New York City is um, an epicenter of culture and, of course, international um, activities, the human beings who live in them, their sexual, of course, and, of course, their gender disposition is also experiencing this kind of colonization and these international um, differences. And through this novel, it emerges with um, the idea that the world as well as people, and as well as things, and as well as the city itself is also is in the process of becoming. And what we should understand or seems to suggest in the novel about how the becoming emerges or, or happens is that for Jameson, a becoming is not a state at a, a, at a historical point, but also a state in terms of how affective qualities are being transformed or, or transferred to living practices. For example, how people engage in relationships, how marriages are formed, how friendship is formed, and how business associations are being cultivated. So uh, we're just going to wrap up now. Um, just kind of close the presentation. Um, to all of these texts, I think that this text the mark that neither history or ideas of history or a sociological uh, approach to history is enough for understanding the world, but that we should also use imagination to propose a style of critical reflection on our contemporary world. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Would like to start us off. Any questions, comments? Anyone read any of these novels? No, I definitely got curious, but yeah, I mean, I was, um, you know, I was actually curious about how you chose the roles for like, the many possible those persons that yes, yeah, so and then uh, commonality of thinking about shared care economies across all of them, but like out of the many media sources, how, how did you eventually decide to arrive at the, the kind of situation? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so while I'm thinking about the text to choose, I was considering um, students that talk about uh, locational issues or issues of location in terms of migration and of course cultural causes. And um, also, the novel that also pay attention to the non human aspects of our world. I'm going from um, I, you guys' idea of taking, things, uh, taking care of things in association with one another. Um, the motivation for choosing them might be from my own understanding that there are human beings, or for example, in most animist uh, cultures, there is the belief that there are human beings and there are non human beings. And these um, beings also are present in our world. So I was looking for stories 
that kind of my qualities qualities or kind of those are all of these qualities. So um and also because some of the writers are, are considered also are also migrants. So they moved from Africa to the US and mm -hmm. while some are still writing from Africa and some bear should who are children of African immigrants or people who bear no even as slaves to um, the Americas. Something yeah. rather small. Yeah, no, um, as a follow up to Heidegger, because I remember when I was at Durham, there were some professors who were very against using this text because of the history that he had in, as a German philosopher. So I was wondering if that came up for you. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, um, I think one of the responses that as by Mitchell and Peter Tony, which I lived in. Um, yeah, so Peter Andrew Winchell and uh, Peter Tony in their book, um, I did that black notebook. So I did that as complicity, you know, in the notorious black notebooks, as in one of the major talking points about the difference between his work and his life. So it seems that the man we encounter, the idea we can encounter in his work is different from. The man in his private like in his private life. So that has one of the very good work I also um, encounter uh issues that I also have to deal with. But however I take a cue from uh, Peter Tony and uh, and the Witcher who argue that rather than protect Aiga from the condemnatory and anti-Semitic readings, so I'm quoting Peter and uh, um, Tony and Richard now, that rather than protect Aiga from the condemnatory anti-Semitic reading, we should instead offer him up to it completely, so as to follow the string length of the black notes books and the decades of work that follows to be had, to be what is capable of withstanding or resisting the mighty, the mighty interpretation as well as what is not. And in any sense, uh, moved by his money, he argues that the Jewish system is still out of Africa. So, um. I find the idea of recording very useful um, to are not um, as a footnote, one must pay uh, attention or take cognizance of the fact that there is this complicity, there is this controversy about Aida as a scholar. Uh, but however, I find the idea of recording quite um, in an ethical way very useful, and that the other is that. Appropriated to for previous other uh, concern, global issues, and all that. Could I add something to Lynn's point here? But of course, I think it's an important one. It's you know one thing is his complicity in you know the anti-Semitic um, discourse of the right, but you know there's also another critique that he essentializes certain categories, right? There is essentially I think not that you also reference in, in your interpretation of the novels, right? It, I'm just wondering, are you? Know, you you, you read these novels also with an idea to imagining blackness, right? You know, you know, different kinds of, of being together, community, and so forth. Do you, do you find this difficult, you know, or, or, or is it actually inspiring to think through Heidegger and you know, these, you know, these essential categories of, of race, of ethnicity, of identity? Or you know, do you rather deconstruct them? Right? You know, some of the novels seem to be rather going in this direction. Yeah, I think I find it um find it stimulating at least for the for, in terms of um what I would like to achieve mm -hmm. right with my aims in the project. I find that it stimulates my thinking mm -hmm. using this concept. Mm -hmm. And um given the fact that for example as um, um El Sharawi who is more like a historical materialist mm -hmm. who talks about um how modern is also a generative Materialism. Um, that genetic materialism pays attention to human materials as well as cultural materials, whether clothing and all that. Mm -hmm. So I find this generative process as a very um as, as some kind as a kind of organizing principle for thinking through several cultures, mm -hmm. especially given that I'm writing about black cultures across you know, the divides of the Atlantic. So seeing that how the global or the uh, global Contemporary global world, it's also kind of generating. You have people traveling, you have people 
um, working for political and economic connection and intersections in terms of political and of course ideological um, beliefs and all that. So um, the idea of sport is original, especially in our contemporary world, is very contested. Mm -hmm. And so I find that things to stand watching, you know, in applying applying to some other categories or mm -hmm. disciplines or um I would say um some sites of inquiry like can be very useful, you know, at least for my project. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if you have you people first and then you have no 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 you no I think you're 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 you um, so I'm just wondering about the sort of directionality of who gets to sort of define Blackness and Black worlds and sort of imagine Black creatures. I think it's really fascinating and super important. I'm mean, thinking in similar lines around the idea of relationality and sort of mutual um, connections and responsibility to place and then beings, non human or the human beings in indigenous contexts. And I think um, what's really fascinating about this work is that we're both you're you're thinking about or you're um, the authors are imagining both connections with land and with beings and with ancestors as well as connections with the broad diaspora. And so my understanding um very limited um is that there's a bit of tension um in terms of the African American experience in the US at least um versus uh, based on whether or not you're coming from a Caribbean context versus say African continental context versus other, you know, long histories of having um, descended from slaves in the US, right? So I'm just curious about how those, if there are tensions that you note, and maybe you spoke to them and I missed it, but just curious about this sort of idea of who gets to sort of um, imagine um, Blackness and diaspora and belonging in these contexts, and also sort of this idea of the worlding, right, with the process of so it's kind of a giant question, but I'm just curious if you could just say a little bit about that because I would I would expect there would be some tension, but I just wanted to hear you. you say yeah, that. yeah, I I I would like to acknowledge that of course the experience of Africans in Africa is quite different from African American and as well as those in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And um, so what who, who decides who is black? And I think my uh, my response would be I don't know what actually we talk about that mm -hmm. blackness is can be both a technological fiction, can be sociological fiction, and also that it can also be an organized way of understanding the cross cultural interaction among people of African descent. So from who determines who is black, everyone who access is of African descent. And um, the experience is maybe different, but it is productive in a way that it begins to help us to see how blackness as a category also emerges, right? So there's no, um, I would say there's no kind of uniform understanding of what blackness is. You can see that is blackness, right? This imagine. And um, for me, I also think that for people who write about blackness or Africa, Africans of African descent who were in this question of blackness. Blackness is also being interpreted in terms of their own, um, I would say, um, maybe I would say personal or human. Um, I'm trying to find the right word for it now. Or let me just say personal experiences. Now, mm -hmm. um, for example, this, uh, this writer, Harry Selassie, who talks mm -hmm. about being Afropolitan and say that you carry Africa with you wherever you go. That you don't have to be physically tied to the homeland, that wherever you go, whether you are in Europe, whether you are in the US, or whether you are in the Caribbean, you carry Africa wherever you go. So the idea of Afro-Politanism mm -hmm. also inspires our own understanding of what blackness is. Um, irrespective of um, your maybe your place of birth, your nationality, um, historical and cultural context matter. Mm -hmm. Can I just have a quick follow-up? Um, I don't want to push the sort of uh, comparison too far, but 
But so I'm thinking of right now, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's been a sort of crisis of pretendians over in North America where a lot of folks are claiming uh, indigenous ancestry or indigenous status, many of them in very high academic uh, or administrative positions. And then it's coming out that, in fact, they were sort of fudging and not being totally honest about their background, or perhaps like Elizabeth Warren, oh, I found out I have Cherokee genes, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of thing, which there was so much pushback and anger from indigenous communities because um, there's this idea that you're not just part of that identity because of your genes, but it's really about the relationships that you work to build through your entire life, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit, I was thinking about that. So um, obviously, I can't imagine um, what that must feel like to be um, coming from an African, um, uh, having roots with Africa and sort of what that means. Uh, but I'm just interested in, so so let's say you're born and raised in a very, um, you know, uh, affluent family in uh, in the U.S. or in Canada or what have you, um, but then you claim a very strong connection, right? So I'm just wondering if that sort of comparison, how does that work? Um, and I know it's you can't possibly you know, boil it down to anything, but hopefully you get it what I'm trying to do. Yes, yes, I think I do. Um, well, um, Look, I think one way to respond to that by citing the way of um, a famous like English scholar, mm -hmm. um, she's called Karen Baba. So she moved from Birmingham in the UK, she went to Nigeria to a place called Ileife, um, where it's considered to be this like the epicenter of Yoruba, of Yoruba and she lived there for many years. Um, she learns the culture, she speaks the language, and uh, she was given, she was certainly given like a lot of female custodians of culture mm -hmm. in, in the community. And um, however, she never says um, she's African, mm -hmm. right? But so, my response to that would be that um, authentic Africanness. Um, if you have to just to put it in absolute terms, it may only be you know, defined in relation to maybe genetics or maybe cultural roots and stuff like that. However, um, like I think Paul Gregor, Gregor makes the argument in the Black Atlantic that Africanists can also interpolate you know, on other cultures and other people. And that means that it means that it's inviting you to come and share. In the media experience. Um, so, in terms of maybe genetics and cultural roots, I may not say um, somebody's entirely African, but um, by interpolating on other cultures, drawing from other cultures, and influencing other cultural practices, um, Africa is interpolating, you know, um, and is asking them to join them, or, or not to join them as a club, or to just be part of. Um, the what I would call the cultural reminiscence and the um, promotion of the culture. Uh, that doesn't entirely say that those cultures are African. So we get to say who is African. Um, I, I don't think I have any formidable arguments for that. I think I would say that um, past to Islam's genetic and cultural roots, we have um, a stronger say in that. The fact of the is they are and their identity. Um, you know, it raises all sorts of interesting questions about what you do with South Africans who've been there for generations. Right. More immediate ancestry is European, and yet we all are descended from Africans because that's where human beings come from. So they're interesting groups too. But I, I wanted to ask a, a different question. So how uh, with some of these novels, you know, it arguably uh, maybe wasn't entirely clear, and definitely you have to use the sound. Uh, they sound great. Um, to, to what extent is it part of your thinking about what constitutes the sort of black futurism and, and you know, this roving aspect that it, that it does or does not work with traditional um, sort of African ethical mm -hmm. values and value systems? Um, are, is that important? I mean, I think your resonances sometimes from your descriptions, other times it's less clear to me. 
So I don't know if that was actually an important part of your thinking about this bringing up these models, or or is it? Or, or just could you? Yeah, I think it's like a good name, but that kind of more thoughtful things. Um, I have to kind of know it mm -hmm. um, there's less, um, there's less privacy on the ultra, um, submission mm -hmm. in terms of maybe pushing it to the future, but mm -hmm. rather this the control or the part as a result that they can draw upon and between mm -hmm. their presence and their future. But for those novels mm -hmm. that are more like African features, mm -hmm. that's where it still takes place in Africa. Uh, where the characters are Africans, where the Niger is especially identifies as an African, um, you see um, attention being put on culture and how that culture is some form of epistemological uh, resource, I would say, for organizing the future, the society, and of course, how they, they will decide to live their lives. So, this is one of the tensions, I would say, between the two brands, where that of African futurists. I would like to okay, culture is to this job. Where that book is okay, culture is always a resort you can draw up for you know, and may not take like a people or a major book me describing or or portraying or like or what represents our future. Okay. So um I feel that this tension may not be persist for a while and you're not really agree with, but it's also part of the genetic movement, I believe, in the spirit of all the genetic is a continual process and become a real coming and the future is also of holding. The future is not also set, not holding. We have we have a future of it, but it's all thoughts for our time as a Thank you very much, Thank you. Question because I'm totally like ignorant about um ethics and um literature so, um, in general. Um I wanted to ask about the language that's used in in the, the literature that you introduced today, that I, I'm assuming they were all originally written in English. Yes. Okay. So well, the, what my question is like um do people like what what um like the, the writers, why do they choose to write English? And does it have any like implications? Um, you know, that, that they didn't have a choice of writing in like some indigenous uh, or like African language, for example. And also in Africa, there like um, one of the texts um, had French in it too. Yeah. So. My question from like like uh, the Japanese background is that you have a choice of writing in English or Japanese, but the, in the way the different degree of colonization, I guess that, that Japan has a very strong culture like on its own, so most people will write in, in Japanese, and then if you choose to write in English, you have a specific audience that's outside um, Japan that. To, you know that that you have as a sort of other reader, but I'm I'm wondering like what the situation in Africa, the yeah like why do they? Um yes, so most of these writers write in English or either French if they are from the French, uh, like from the school language the French, and um or however if any like. Fantasy or speculative literature in Africa were written in the original way. One of the very famous ones, which have now been um, translated to English, um, the title of the translated version is um, The Forest of the Pagan Demons. So, it was originally written by um, a Nigerian novelist who wrote about four of those novels in the indigenous language. Um, however, due to the, of course, the effects of colonization and over the years, and the fact that uh, due to colonization, migration, and also uh, indigenous languages uh, do not have the kind of uh, linguistic currency or international you know, kind of um, appeal that they should have, right? And that's why these writers put themselves to 
my app also bring me up very we just have events with knowledge that culture for young African Americans nice. who okay. would want to talk about Africa, the African heritage, who we never know um, the language that they okay. have access to it and all that. So in this seems to be like uh, a tool that we use which it, it is past audience that mm -hmm. comprises of people at home and people in the diaspora. And like um um Chino Achipe, which is a famous novelist, says that says that that English has been given to him, that mm -hmm. and that is going to make sure he uses it for the purposes of his own um, cultural and of political you know, views. Thank you. Can you yeah, please uh, yeah. talk about uh, the this cultural aspect mm -hmm. of uh, using non-human agents? Um, would you say without? I don't want to essentialize, but some cultures have more kind of general. Mm -hmm. I guess they have a proximity. I guess in in their world view, like using non-human agencies as just something that you do, and um, non-English cultures tend to to have that. Like for example, I was um, we um I went to some seminar on Taiwanese language, and there are like Taiwanese uh, writers also use agencies to talk about to address like an um, environmental issue. So do you think that even writing in English, like there is more um, I, I don't want to say it's easier, but it's it's more something that they can use this as uh how to say like a proof or like a more persuasive way of addressing the um, uh, environmental issues or like global crisis that we're facing when they when when you have that in the the, the, the culture that you live in. But then I don't want to essentially <laughs> so it's kind of yeah, yeah fine so, line. Um what I understand at least in most African cultures is that to a very large extent, despite the fact that um, many African societies seem to be more modern than they used to be a few years ago, mm -hmm. there is that um, that, that in a uh, really funky with the um, animate world. So there is this like there's some kind of animist philosophy that um, just as um, for example trees, um, the environment, nature's. And for example, um, are also part of human living. Um, for example, places like Lagos or Nigeria, or even most parts of uh, West Africa, the idea of the mummy water. That who is the mummy, or we we'll call the mummy, um, is still my like, present, even though, like, and so that the cultural talent that you don't do, that, for example, uh, don't do this in the sea or just like the seashore and stuff like that. So in many cultures, those kind of you know cultural uh, morals, I would say or restrictions of rules guided by the understanding of the animist, uh, the animates world that is not human, um is still to be seen to be. And um, I think for many leaders who are out of African descent who read some of this work, they would uh, they will relate to this um this quite well. Mm -hmm. Could I uh, quick, quick follow up on, on your question here? Because uh, listening to you, and you know, I share all this um, ignorance about it, I haven't read these novels, but there seem to be in most of them kind of dystopian element in there, right? You know, so it's either you know, it's environmental degradation, violence, you know, and, and then it is a sense of community building, building new values, new sense of community. Um, and, and I'm ju just wondering, did you? Choose these, you know, in a, in a, you know, with respect to this thing. That seems to be, you know, the environmental crisis response to it seems to be a theme that runs in a way through, you know, the kind of um, society being dissolved, you know, without rules, uh, violence, right, and and then the response, right. And, it's, and then you also have to see the kind of futuristic sense of, you know, looking to the future, new new um, planets, even right to rebuild. Uh, in a, in a way, is this one of the key themes, you know, um, yeah. that, that you try to bring to, uh, to you know, bring them together with yeah. these models? Yeah, um, because 
think dystopia seems to be very poor that its writers use. And I think while I was choosing these books, I was also um I was paying attention to that in the selection of the text. Mm -hmm. Because dystopia seems to be a metaphor that its writers use in not just uh, representing the present situation as well in, in the African mm -hmm. American experience, and of course in places like Africa where there are still of course scholarly issues and all that. Right. However, they often close with some kind of retrovision right. that, um, that kind of projects the achievable future mm -hmm. that they want for themselves. So uh, it's more like both inflection, though they are future historians, it's more inflection of the present, mm -hmm. and of course, the future they aim to kind of um, achieve for themselves as a community and of hopefully for the, for the rest of the world. So yeah, I think uh, when I was selecting the text, yes, I, will, I, will, I, will, I was saying that in mind. And is dystopia also a lens to interpreting colonialism in your your novels? I, I felt a bit like, like this as well. And yeah, also um, given your interest right in colonial post-colonial literature, do you see you know in a, in a way it is, is a powerful tool to represent the violence endemic in particular Western societies? Um, I actually never. I haven't thought about it along that line, but yeah, I think it could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was something I would like to do. That would take to This is a little off topic for you, but um, I, I'm also interested in film, so I'm wondering if you have any comments about things you see going on in film other other than Black Panther, which is many people, at least in a certain white people in North America's first introduction to African futurism and it's Stimulated interest, which is great. But are there other films, you know, coming out of any other parts of the world, obviously continent of Africa or Caribbean or, or anywhere? Because I would like to follow up on some examples. Yeah. We have indigenous examples because again, um, um, dystopianism, as the character says in, in I think it's in the Crested Snow, we've already lived through an apocalypse. So of course we know how to deal with it. <laughs> Or, or we will, we'll deal with it. Um, uh, and other other folks make these connections, but and in Blood Quantum, although it's a terrible movie, you know, sort of deals with that as well. Um, but yeah, is there anything going on in the film that you see where you, that, that you would uh, link yeah. up or is doing some work? In? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, like a couple of films come to mind. Um, an exchange called Punzi, um, P U N C I. Um, there is another, another one, Sankofa, and I think there is one that was released, I think, last year. Maybe some first, I think that was the idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see what my name is? Can you see M Z I? Okay. M as in M as in M. Mm -hmm. Neptune. Neptune, of course, I think, yeah. For us. Of course, like the power when Yeah, yeah. Just call it. Neptune, of course. Of course, I would say that power always. Yes. Okay. Any other moments of suggestions? I definitely thought, you know, Jody's now outside here. You know, once a year before the summer break, we have uh, CFPS leads where we share uh, suggestions for uh, good reads for the summer. So I mean, we definitely make sure we have people around <laughs> for that one because uh, we're filming, but also the novels. And that has a lot of good suggestions, you know, what you indulge in for the next couple of weeks. Any other comments, questions? I have one. Yeah, it's wrong. Um, so, oh. great presentation to start with. Um, you speak a lot about nature and the environment, but I'm wondering just from you being here in Victoria, um, mm -hmm. it's kind of more of a broad question on your opinion and your learning since being here, but um, what have you? learned kind of from the indigenous peoples here and their connection to nature. Like can you make a comparison? Do you see any differences? Yes. Um I think for me 
my intervention is because control so I get to be clear as in maybe uh, attending a few performance festivals. However, I took a course in indigenous literature in my first year. And um, so what I so my own experience, if I'm to kind of summarize, I would say that in indigenous um, culture here yeah, is also kind of bit animals. Um however it's at this approach or its attitude to nature is that um, for example, nature, not only nature is should be wasted. Um, for example, when um, they kill, they want to kill, say, yeah, they have to pay. So I think it's, it's not, not just, um, not just seeing this. I think it's in my most general argument I'm making in my presentation that um, these non human beings are agency and should be respected as the offspring. So you see them praying to it, people not kill it as mm -hmm. an animal. So I think, um, yeah, that's what I have to learn. And um, how do you use, I think that's also true in my own culture, from where I come from, where even animal skin and stuff like that are kind of recycled and used for other stuff, like for example, household stuff, and sometimes spoons, foods, and the like. So, yeah, I, I feel that uh, the need for the salvation of, the, of nature is very, it's a common culture at this year. Um, there's no other uh, question. Maybe I have one that you know, looking again at your CV sparked my my curiosity, and I'm just wondering if you briefly talk to your media experience in working with these groups or research networks. And, and you know, like I can see you know um, literature is traditional, but uh, is there a different type of media you're interested in your research as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I kind of more kind of more interested in audio, mm -hmm. um, digital audio, especially um, stuff like soundscapes, like mm -hmm. the sound of the world, like sometimes just doing you know, sounds of daily activities, like mm -hmm. the sculpting of papers, mm -hmm. and, like it are the kind that make up our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And how do we recognize this sound? How do they become familiar? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes how are they all familiar to us? Um, why do we associate a certain sound to a certain activity? Mm -hmm. And the like, what if I have never experienced this activity? Would I understand what the sound is kind of um, reflecting or representing and all that? To understand how the world, you know, nature and life, you know, and how we interact with it and the sound of the world kind of. Mm -hmm. Cool. I can see another presentation coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, that, that's actually Heidegger when doing his walks, you know, he, he reflected in very similar, you know, things, you know, he might have read this, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, reflecting on, you know, being, you know, also uh, sharing uh, farm life, right, and being in nature. And yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments? If you don't, you know where to find Sam, you know, for uh, for further, you, know, you might have. Well, you know, it's a good connection to your own work, but but thank you very much, Sam. And I uh, hope you know your time at the center will help you to fully flesh out your yeah. uh, your your thesis. <laughs> yeah. And and I hope you can some stage, not too far into the future, celebrate your doctoral. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.